thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to use this opportunity to thank organizers for inviting me to give a talk at such distinguished conference. Uh, I would like to ask organizers to allow me to show a demonstration of the screen. So basically, talk today is to give you an update on what is going on during the antibiotic use and consumption, what is going on with the resistance, and what is the Russian experience in fighting against resistance during the coronavirus pandemic. I'm representing different organizations, one of them is the Logical Verification Center of Antimicrobial Resistance, also we are WHO Collaborating Center for a Capacity Building on Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance and Research. So generally, I would like to start with a very well-known fact that antimicrobials in general and antibiotics in particular are quite young drugs. They have been discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming in 1928. You can see here below the basically the fungi penicillium notatum, which has been discovered by the Fleming and afterwards the penicillin itself has been named. The USSR has a priority in design and actually discovery of new antimicrobials. And uh, Zinaida Vesona Yermolyeva, Soviet scientist who in 1942 created Soviet penicillin, penicillin crustazin, and she used completely different fungi, penicillin crustosum. What antibiotics gave to the community is actually quite clearly shown on this slide. You can see that before antimicrobials and antibiotics, the chances for the patient to die with the pneumonia was nine out of 10. After the discovery of penicillin, this figure decreased up to one to 10. So basically this is a crucial discovery of 20th century alongside with the clean water and vaccination. What I can also tell that basically from the one hand, we have a majority of antimicrobial drugs. We have more than 200 antimicrobials registered within the Russian Federation. The largest class is antibacterial antimicrobial drugs or antibiotics. Also quite well-designed antifungals. For example, we have eight different classes and basically we have found a some time of new discoveries because of increase of number of fungal infection, especially in specific subset of the patients. Also, we have a quite substantial discovery in antivirals and antiprotozoals. And basically, from the one hand, we have a quite substantial number of these drugs. From another hand, unfortunately, we have a lack of new antimicrobials, which you'll talk about. Another issue which substantially limits our capabilities in effectively treatment of infection is actually antimicrobial resistance. I would like to show this slide just to remind you that any drug or any substance which possess activity against different bacteria or fungi or viruses or protozoa actually unfortunately will have a resistance. Certainly the time of development of resistance differ from different antimicrobials and antibiotics, but under any circumstances, antibiotic resistance is a biological phenomenon. And there are no drugs to which no resistance has been observed. This is a crucial issue to understand and our effort should be concentrated on limitation of development and further spread of resistance microorganisms rather than prevention of resistance itself. Well, generally, what influence of resistance does on new technologies? I will like just give you a couple examples. For example, cesarean section led to increase of global GDP to 2%. Highly effective drugs in oncology plus 0.75%. Other issues also gave us quite a substantial increase in world GDP. So for example, these four procedures will lead to 4% of world GDP growth by 2020 in money is in about 120 trillion profits. But unfortunately, if the AMR growth rate remains the same until 2050, the global economic losses might be up to 7% of world GDP, which is equivalent to $210 trillion. And maternal mortality, for example, alongside, will increase by more than 50 times. So what are the challenges in the fight against resistances? We felt quite strongly that lack of knowledge is remain the challenge number one. We are doing quite a substantial effort with the support of Russian Academy of Sciences and Ministry of Health of Russian Federation in education of physicians. They have a different type of activities, including journals, webinars, evidence-based seminars, etc., And also we are quite actively 
stimulating people to publish in the peer-reviewed journals, which is listed in Scopus, like this journal, for example. Also, what we need to understand, without the classical education of population, I fully agree with Vice President of Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, Academician Donning, she said that without the introduction of knowledge to the general population, we wouldn't solve this problem. I will give you just a couple examples. So it was a quite interesting data published in 2007 originally with a question to general populations. Can antibiotic kill viruses? And to our big surprise, you can see in 2007, 45% of Russian population said yes. In 2011, before pandemic, 46% said yes. What is the positive side of this data? We can actually see in 2018, which we saw that based upon the recent published review, only 35% said yes. So general, all efforts which everybody produced within the Russian Federation led to quite substantial influence on knowledge of general population antibiotics. And again, it gives an additional assurance that the basically classical evidence-based messages actually might lead to education of the general population, thus limiting the resistant microorganism spread. We have a quite successful campaign on education of general population racial antibiotic use. It has been a pilot study. Right now, we are actually extending this with the support of Ministry of Health throughout the country. And we do hope that basically this classical informational campaign will show the positive side on the general knowledge of our population, thus again limiting the resistance rate. Certainly, change number two is evolution. Certainly, bacteria are evolutionizing, and I'll give you an example of nosocomial infection. You can see that in 20s of the last century, 50s of the last century, gram positives were dominating. And you can see that starting from 2000, we unfortunately see the gram negative bacteria prevalence. And currently, 75% of all nosocomial infections based upon our data within the Russian feeding hospitals are actually due to gram negative bacteria. Again, unfortunately, the resistance is the main change for antimicrobial th therapy. And unfortunately, resistance also evolutionizes from single drug resistance to multiple drug resistance to unfortunately pan resistances. And again, this is a global challenge. And again, I would like to call for a general collaboration with this subject because again, it has been showed by Lord O'Neill in a very famous publication, which has been actually presented first time on the World Economic Forum in Davos that if nothing will be done in resistance, the total losses in GDP might lead more than $100 trillion in human lives in more than 300 million losses by 2020, which is actually two population of Russian Federation of half population of the European Union. Also, what is very important to remember about antimicrobial resistance is actually that no country is free from, it, from this problem. And you can see again, this is very classical data showing that certainly the influence and spread and actually uh, reality with IMR in different countries differ. But again, no country is free. And this is estimates how many people might prematurely die due to antimicrobial resistance in 2020. And you can see that figures are extremely striking. Also, one last figure which I would like to share with you that again, Currently, based upon expert estimation, approximately 700,000 people die due to infection due, caused by resistance bacteria. But again, if nothing will be done by the scientific community and the politicians, this figure might reach 10 million per year by 2050, which will be higher than the number of deaths due to cancer, 8.2 million. And again, this is a classical call, what should be done in, in fight against antimicrobial resistance. So generally, if we translate this in our patient issue, we have approximately 2 million nosocomial infections annually. Based upon our data, resistance to three or more classes of antibiotics has been observed up to 98% of gram-negative bacteria. So basically, susceptibility to only one antibiotic has been observed only in two-thirds of bacteria. So translating this into empiric antimicrobial therapy, we can conclude that in the absence of adequate resistance data, a chance to get effective empiric therapy in our patients is less than 30%. So what 
pandemic of new coronavirus infections actually taught us. Well, if you have a look on the consumption within the Russian Federation, our country, based upon our data, looked very nicely. We had an average consumption. And again, if you compare this 12.6 GDP per 1,000 population with other countries, you can see that we are looking very nicely on the right-hand side of this slide towards the countries of Northern Europe, which are actually characterizing quite low consumption of antimicrobials. And again, it is very positive sign showing that our doctors, at least in the community, are actually very careful when they're prescribing antimicrobials. But unfortunately, what has happened in 2020 due to the pandemic, we actually observed quite a substantial increase in the consumption of antimicrobials. The increase was 28% or 4.1 GDP per 1,000 population. And again, you don't need to be growing antimicrobials that will inevitably lead to increase of resistance in community-acquired bacteria. And again, if you have a look on the antimicrobials, which has been consumption of which has been increased up substantially, unfortunately, if these drugs, which has been extensively used in the community, acquired infections. First of all, it's azithromycin and levofloxacin and other fluoroquinolones. So this is a classical example that unfortunately, pandemic and new coronavirus infections will lead inevitably to increase of resistances. And again, if we will use WHO classification of new consumption of different classes of antibiotics in Russia, we looked in 2019 very nicely, approximately, you know, excess and watch antimicrobials 50-50. And you can see in 2020, those antimicrobials, which are included to the watch list, their consumption has been increased. And again, this is due to azithromycin and levofloxacin. So today, quite a number of things has been said about veterinary use of antimicrobials, and I fully support what has been said previously. I'll give you just one example. You know, if you look on the antibiotic consumption in the US, if you have a look on the human medicine annually, that basically only 1.3 million kilograms antimicrobials are used in humans. And 10 times more has been used in animals. And look on the first line of this slide. 11.2 million kilograms of antibiotics has been used for so-called prophylaxis in animals as a growth promoters. And I absolutely agree with all colleagues. It should be stopped because we understand quite clearly that whether we will find traces of antimicrobials, this will inevitably lead to increase of resistance in the humans. And that is why, as a physicians, we will experience quite a substantial problems in empiric and also etiotropic therapy of our patients. Certainly, the lack of new drugs has been said quite substantially. I will give you just two small examples. You can see that the number of pharma companies which has been developed on new antimicrobials dropped from A18 to 5 by 2011. It sounds strange, but generally antibiotics became very unsuccessful for pharma companies. That is why many governments, and what is crucially important, our government using the program Pharma 2020 and Pharma 2030, are stimulating big pharma and small and medium enterprises come back for the development of new antimicrobials. And fortunately, we started to see basically that the seeds of this support will lead to development of new antimicrobials, and we already starting to have quite a number of drugs. What also new pandemic taught us, that technologies with proven efficacy should be used. And I would like to give you an example of vaccination, not only vaccination using very well-known bacterial vaccines, but what is crucially important for a fight against AMR is indirect effect of antiviral vaccines, including new coronavirus vaccines, including the three Russian vaccines, which is available, and fourth, which will become available based upon our minister information in the beginning of May. Generally, using of vaccines, decreased number of infections, decrease of consumption of antimicrobials, decrease of resistances. This is plethora of vaccines which became available during the last centuries, ladies and gentlemen. And I would like to predict that within the next couple of decades, we will see much more new vaccines. And again, we need to look into the vaccines as the way basically to control resistances. So what to do next? Generally, Russian Federation developed a national policy on the use of antimicrobial drugs based on regional and local resistance data. This is order of government of Russian Federation published in 2017. 
And again, I would like to give you just a simple examples of these seven main steps which has been taken. First of all, informing of populations. I gave you an example of the information campaign which was successful as a pilot study. Second one is improving the training level of specialists. Russia now is implementing professional standard of medical microbiology, and hopefully it will be approved this year. So we'll start to prepare completely new specialists which will deal with this problem. Improving measures to prevent and limit the spread and circulation of pathogens with AMR. Also, what is incredibly important, and I will give you a couple examples as a couple last slides on systematic monitoring of spread of antimicrobial resistance as our example. Study mechanism of resistance, basically improving measures to prevent infections. And again, seven part, which is incredibly important, and I would like to congratulate organizers of this conference, that interdepartmental and actually international collaboration is a crucial part of actually any activities within the field of AMR. So I will give you last example of our own implement, implemented measure. So basically different AMR surveillance system exist and we developed ours, which called uh, AMR map. You can see the website, antimicrobial resistance surveillance in Russia, which is incredibly interesting and unique product, which doesn't have analogies in the world right now. Basically, we're showing the trends, real figures of resistances within the 71 cities within the Russian Federation. And you can see that actually how, you know, changed number of participants within this study, and we have, as I mentioned, 71 cities. What is new about the data, data sources? Basically, what is crucially important that we have a, or not only qualitative, we have quantitative data, which allowing us not only to obtain clear-cut resistance level within the specific cities and regions, but also allows us to predict what will happen. And also combining this with the consumption data, with the you know, molecular data, basically provide the best approaches to the choice of antimicrobials. And again, we can see that key functionalities include potentially also interactive maps and other projects which might be used using this map. Of our further development, we're actually looking at the phenotypes, looking at the genotypes. We have specific developed specific uh, system of SNP typing, and also in the nearest future, basically SNP typing now includes the data of more than 4,000 Asinetobacter baumannii, or more than 2,700 Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and more than 2,000 Klebsiella pneumonia. So generally. We actually translating the phenotypic, genotypic data into the decision making. And we also development of system of support of certainly making a decision. So ladies and gentlemen, our next development within the country will be developing AMR Cloud, which is a web-based platform for analysis and sharing of antimicrobial resistance surveillance data. And I would like to call upon you to potentially start using this product. And again, because we already have a quite a good experience in including international experience in using this. So generally, this platform is open web platform that allows users to manage, multiply AMR project and data sets, import metadata and IST the results directly from Excel of CSV type, automatically determine clinical SIR categories, exploring data using smart filters, expert statistics and infographics, and also generate web links and share results depending on the user activity. So ladies and gentlemen, General Russian Federation has something to offer world, and I will give you just one simple example from human medicine. And again, but I would like finishing my presentation to say that international collaboration in this field is actually crucial. What is important of surveillance? The measure is to know. If you cannot measure it, you can't approve it, which has been said by Lord Kelvin, and I would like to strongly support this. The need to measure, we need to look at molecular genetics, but we need to translate this knowledge into the concrete measures. If it will be successful, at least on 75%, we will fight against IMR resistances very successfully. Thank you very much for your attention.